me. And it's it's really incredible to be here with you because for me I'm from also from old school, so I'm trying to to get in here this this new world. Um, and I think art pool is um, a special um, um, platform because it's the um, I think the first one greater uh, platform of NFTs. So for me, it's really um, important to have creatorship. And I'm, I'm working with the pro in the project of Guatemala Pavilion with Chris Papita. Papita. And welcome, and let's, let's learn about it. Thank you. Hey, uh, how you doing? My name is Gianni Lee. I'm a visual artist. I'm from Philadelphia, the U.S. Um, I'm self-taught, and I guess I started my artistic journey by one day deciding, I had a clothing brand originally, and I decided to start painting. And what's interesting about my story is that I started painting like primarily in the streets, and I kind of like evolved my art form from starting in the streets the streets was like my canvas you know so i was like a street artist and um got into visual art in a uh, more standard painting that way so it's like my introduction to the art world was like totally physical but since i'm self-taught i think i didn't really um allow like institutions to kind of like shape my trajectory of where I went with art. So that allowed me to like take on new technologies and just try things, just throw things at the wall and see what stuck. So like, because of that, that's what got me into crypto into the idea of like taking my art and putting it in a digital space. But since I started in physical, it, it was, you know, just the language of kind of like merging the worlds. And um, yeah, so that's how I'm here and yeah. Tam Green, I'm a curator. My research has always been like the intersection between art and other industries. Like I've always um, coming from On art and architecture, working with cities, working with neighborhoods, um, most lately art and retail and art and commerce. And uh, a couple of years ago, I started going really deep into the research of art and technology, art and finance, and that's where I found art and blockchain. And this has been my focus for the last couple of years. Currently, I'm working with uh, an organization, a decentralized organization called Rally.io, where I help uh, all kinds of creative communities in the art world, whether they're museums or galleries or artists, create their own autonomous digital economies, uh, which means NFTs and cryptocurrencies, and to help them have abundance and fundraise for their projects without commoditizing every single piece. And, and yes, I'm very, I am love working with Artpool and very excited to be here today. So I'm sure you guessed like how, how did we came up with this beautiful panel, but Francesca and Luca has been in, um, on Artpool in the network for, for quite a while already. Then, um, introduced us to Simone that's going to be very soon on our pool. I think it's just because she didn't have time to create a profile. So she will bring Chris on board and and, and um, introduce us to, to tell you we have and we'll show you later on. But we are currently working on a project with uh, Jenny and Tam uh, that's going to be in the metaverse. So these like digital spaces. Um, we'll show you a little aperçu of it, um, and it's pretty fun, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk about it later. But just to start that talk, and thank you so much for, for being here for your introduction. Um, I'm feeling really grateful to be with you. Um, what, so we, we, you talked a little bit about street arts, uh, you know, museums, different type of spaces, um, and, and I want to kickstart this conversation with 
what would be for you like your ideal space? Um, it can be some a space you work with already, and you can please like tell us more about it. But when you do curate, when you do exhibit your works, um, what's what's an ideal space for you? How do you you know work with it? Well, what an interesting question that keeps me up at night usually. Um, an ideal space for me first and foremost has to be like true to the times that we are living right now so you know it's not trying to like glorify the past before this pandemic or before covid or you know when there was more support for the arts from the governments now like i think it has to reflect the times that we're living and the times that we are living right now um, are in the middle of the physical and digital space. Like if we think about our inter our human interactions, 65% of our human interactions happen digitally. So um, I imagine uh, quite large physical space, hopefully uh, a space that is historical. I mean, it's easy to say that when you're in Venice, but when you're based in Miami, it's not obvious at all to find a space that, you know, can connect people to some sort of history of the city that can ground you into like what the city has been, th has been through. Um, so like a historical space where artists can hopefully find inspiration from the space, from the materials around, maybe from discarded objects that have been left there, um, abandoned there, and where um, we can discuss like the intersection between art and different industries. So how can art create impact within healthcare, within education, within science, within the economy or you know just a space where we can creators and then hopefully that it has some sort of very strong digital presence so that people from all over the world can learn from this project learn from the curators and the artists involved and so that it's able to transcend and also so that uh, we don't have to think about every single piece as like commoditized or connected to you know how the rent is going to be paid, but um, using blockchain in order to create like a 360 degree sort of abundance for the whole project um, in an organic way. So that's my dream. Wow, that's a that's a, a great question, but I think. I'm not the right person to ask because I'm an artist and I would talk your heads off all day about my, my ideal space because that's what I do. Um, and I know we don't have that time, but my ideal space, um, I feel like I have to be able, you know, actually, I don't, my ideal space can't just be a space for me because I think it has to be a space for the community in order to, um, I guess, digest what it is that you're giving them, whatever it is. It could be video, it can be textile, it can be a painting, it could just be, you know, a performance or whatever it is. But I think I like spaces that evolve and I think that's like very important. I think I like spaces that are able to be, you know, not only evolve, but you they don't they're not the same thing. Like they might be one thing during the day, a different thing during the night. And I think spaces have to be, you know, very involving and they have to be um in a way, they have to uh, allow people to come and be able to learn, you know, and I think that's important. So even if I think of like a space for my art, if I was to design my own space, it would be a space where you could display the work. It would be a space where people can come and actually learn. And I think that's just like very important because for a lot of different reasons, even in business, you want a space where people are able to come for different reasons over and over again. So I think like my space would pretty much be all over the place. but. I don't think that that's a bad thing, but I really think that, you know, we don't take advantage of the spaces that we have. Like, there's, like, thousands of buildings in New York where I live currently where the space is unused. You know, the skyscrapers, the financial district, it's like those spaces could be used for artists at a discounted rate until they find, I guess, the person that wants to come in and actually, like, own that space or rent it out. So... 
that's one thing that's important to me is like not only like the ideal space, but the fact that there's space that already exists and it's not being utilized for anything, not restaurants, not for artists, for uh, residencies or anything like that. So, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, good question because I'm an architect and so, <laughs> uh, but for me, um, I think the ideal space for art is not ideal space, you know, it's just the what art causes in the visitor, for example, here in the Biennial or in some gallery or museum, I, I was always connected um, with the impact or with the, that what, what the art causes in the individual causes. So uh, for me, um, seems to be strange because I'm an architect, so I should maybe realize that it's different for me. But um, when, for example, I am on, on an art fair or a museum or a gallery or an exhibition that I'm creating or organizing, for me, the most important is to see what that is causing in the, in the person who was looking at. This is the ideal space for me, the ideal visit. So, uh, and because I'm really, really, this physical thing, it's really important for me. That's why I'm here also today to catch what, uh, how can we work on the digital platform with this this feeling that uh, for me it's important and so because as you, as he told about the street art for example I'm, I'm from Sao Paulo so uh, there are a lot of street art and good street art and many 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 times I was like wow and see also people in the car like wow a cobra um, cobra or genius and was like wow and that was the, the the ideal space for me you know uh, well my ideal space but i want to start saying like for example here in europe um, you see art everywhere in public spaces and at least in Latin, I don't know the whole Latin America, but listen, Guatemala, uh, people are more into sports or more into music, but uh, not in art, or at least uh, painted and sculpture. So for me, the ideal space as a classical artist, because I, I believe that I'm a classical artist, uh, I love the baroque and the, and the re Renaissance style. For me, spaces where people, all people can see it and can watch it and enjoy it because it feels good when a collector has your painting in their home, but no one, no one is going to watch it. And, and for example, how, as, as I said in Guatemala, uh, people are more into other uh, uh, ways of culture, but not in, in specific, specific in art. And I don't know where, but I just, I, I, I um, I listen to a saying that says something something like uh, build more art schools not because you have to want more uh, or better artists it's because you want better human beings and if you put your art in a public space in a, a museum or a building a, I don't know some, somewhere somewhere where people can watch it every day every day and, and feel the drama feel the, the emotions and this change this is it's a life changer you know. Uh, I don't know, it, it's part of the, it, the, the art the, beca becomes part of their life. And they feel that they own that part of the because you know, it's in a public space. It's, it's where they go to work every day and watch it and, and enjoy it. So for me, that's the ideal space, a public one. Well, I remember about 10 years ago, Francesca and I were in London and went to the Serpentine Gallery. There was a show by Michael Craig Martin. And most of the walls were painted in pink or green or with patterns. And I remember we had this conversation uh, that the white cube uh, standard was really over. It doesn't do an end after 
60 years of service. And uh, in the cube was functional to, to the art of that age. Uh, now, and this also mentioned your curatorially speaking, what you look for is contextual interaction. So, if I have to think uh, of an ideal space, uh, it really it depends on the artworks, it depends on the context. Take this space where you're exhibited now, Chris. This is an industrial space in the historical context. So, this space in Miami or in Philadelphia would have a different meaning, a different feel. But here in Venice, it's kind of out of the box, if you wish. And, and of course, this changes along with the urban context and also so, uh, the ideal space uh, is different every time, depending on the project. Uh, and this was probably in the past. Um, so it's very challenging. And my question is, you know, I was wondering, what would be an ideal space for, for me as a curator in a digital world, in a digital environment? Uh, because how do you get that thickness of context in the digital world? Uh, this is something that we, we're still striving to achieve. Uh, We'll get there at some point. So that's. Um, I don't think that I have uh, an idea. Um, what is happening? <laughs> um, I like the idea of the flexibility. Uh, of um, uses and spaces we are going through in this uh, age. Um, I think it's challenging for an artist and a curator to um, uh, shift or change the general use that a space uh, has. And uh, I like this possibility. Um, this is something that happened very frequently in Venice during the Biennale, where there are, um, when there are many spaces that generally for the rest of the year are, have different purposes. And uh, during the Biennale, they, they change their function. Um, so I like this, as Luca said, the idea of creating uh, a connection between the space and the context, uh, which is very important, in my opinion, um, and, and create a dialogue between the space, uh, the history of the space, uh, and uh, the art pieces uh, uh, curators are planning to, to exhibit there. Um, and I, I personally, I find very challenging to uh, imagine new function for traditional spaces. Um, just an example that it's not properly connected to the art world, uh, but which I find very um, um, focused. Um, connected to what we are saying. In Venice, there was an old theater um, and cinema uh, that uh, some years ago has been transformed into a small supermarket, which I think it's the most beautiful <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, and um, this kind of uh, shift of the use uh, create a lot of uh, um, discussion. Um, but I think it was very interesting, and it's, it's still very interesting to go to buy things, uh, buy food uh, in a so special context. This space was abandoned for years, and, uh, and now uh, buyers can, uh, and customers, 
yeah, buyers can really have a different experience when they go there to buy their food. And the same is for uh, many uh, spaces that have different function and now are used as uh, um, exhibition venues. Um, so this is very interesting because um, uh, one of the purposes of a curator is to, and art, artist as well, is to help visitors uh, to uh, look at things from a different point of view. Yeah, I just wanted to add this, because this is a challenge also for the artists. Here in Venice we have 115 churches, and probably only about 20 or 25 really do service. Uh, so what, what should we do with the rest? And how can we make this interact with the digital technologies? I don't know. Uh, it's very challenging. But of course, uh, social functions are changing. Uh, and the use uh, of spaces should change uh, as well. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting because you have in your ideal spaces, you have covered like all the different points I had, so which is really good. I mean, we're going to go deeper into it. Um, but um, evolving spaces is really interesting, of course, you know, cross bridging. Um, maybe let's go deeper because I think like that's something that link us all is, is this link to the public. Um, I mean, a curator is this kind of invisible link between the artist and the public and giving that new eye on the work. Um, and here, if we could go uh, more into, you know, like concrete examples of how do you uh, mediate, how do you, uh, you know, create that more educational aspect in spaces, uh, because that's, that's a space of discussion, of sharing, of dialogue um, that you have with the artist first, uh, and you have with the curators, but then with, with the public and how, you know, how do you do this kind of travel? Wow, that's such a good question for a curator, and at the same time, I don't think anybody officially asked me this before. Um, but it's true that, you know, the, the work is about translating between the artists and the hidden messages behind the try to teach them something new or try to make, you know, blow their mind with a new perspective. So, um, obviously, the first what is the artist trying to say? What is the common thread amongst all of their work? What is their purpose of being? What do they really need to express so much that it's like coming out in all these different mediums and all these different ways? How are they reflecting a reality that we're all living and that we're all, you know, going through right now, whatever that is? Um, one of the things that I found interesting in this Biennale specifically is that you know, there, were, there was no art that like directly referenced the pandemic, but you could see through like the artist's introspection that everything had to do with the pandemic. So that's what I mean by like reading between the lines, like how do realities affect us and how all of us as a society and how are the artists reflecting that in their work, our connection to nature, to technology, um, can be covered. So it's about understanding those messages, being able to relate to them at like a macro zoomed out level of what people need and want and what they can understand through their senses. Because um, we think a lot of art as only visual, but like I like to try to think about art in 16 different human senses that we have. We all, also, we're taught in school that we have five, but we actually have 16. So there were a lot of works and pavilions in this Biennale where they play with your sense of balance and your sense of orientation and your sense of smell. And there's a lot of other senses where art can be um, interpreted. So 
yes, for me it's all about the truth in the work, the truth of the times that we're living, um, how to connect all those dots, and yeah, and giving the artist the most freedom possible uh, within the space and the context and the explanations and the text, while at the same time making it as approachable as possible for the audience and not making it impossible for the audience to understand, but as approachable as possible to understand. Wait, can you really repeat the question? Well, this one was for you because you talked about... So, you, you did talk about education, so <laughs> it was like how... Um, but if you have even concrete example, like in your work, and how did you bridge like, you create those bridges as well with, with the people who like your work, who want to understand your work, do you have like... I mean, do you do workshops? You like that's. Um, yeah. Um, so, like, like I said before about just like creating a space and just trying to, you know, I hate to always have to think of these things from a business model, but I think like my manager kind of like presses it on me so much. Um, you just have to figure out like like ways of utilizing and like, you know, getting your money's worth or getting your space worth. Like, you know, if like if you, and I think I look at that and I kind of like apply that to when I've had shows and when I've done like events and things like that, I always try to figure out, okay, like what happens after someone comes in and views the work? You know, it's like, how can we utilize the space in different ways? So what I do is, uh, you know, we'll have a talk of course, but then we also try to figure out ways of getting the community involved. And it's like sometimes like the spaces that, you know, I might have partnered with, maybe I did an installation or something like that. And it's like you want foot traffic and you don't want foot traffic just to make money, but sometimes you want foot traffic to introduce people to the space or just to create the conversation. But, you know, you have to be creative. It's like, how else? So it's like, even with me, it's like, okay, we'll do something in the community. We'll bring kids in. You know, we won't just have a talk. Maybe we'll do something where the kids are painting with me. Uh, maybe we'll have a podcast in the space as well. And then like with the advances in technology, um, when you think about AR, you know, uh, augmented reality, for people who don't know what AR is, um, augmented reality even gives you a different uh, way of, you know, utilizing and interpreting the space because now you have this digital aspect. So it's like, let's play off of the physical space in the digital space because we have AR, okay? You use your phone and maybe, you know, the painting now, let's animate that physical painting and you need a QR code to view it and like, but you actually have to be in a physical space to interact with it digitally, you know? So that just brings layers. So I think it's really just about, um, you know, you know, just being a little creative and just thinking outside the box of how you can bring more people into this space. And another thing we like to do is like, and I've done this a lot, like I would bring artists that are friends of mine, recording artists to come in and like actually perform or maybe perform while I'm doing like a live painting or something like that, because that brings a totally different aspect to it. And then also like, I like the DJ on the side. So it's like, let's have a dance party in another part of the space, you know? So. It's interesting because a lot of my, my peers, they look at, you know, sometimes they're like scared to do this. And it's just because once again, it's just from the institutional eye of like what they think art or what they think communication or what they think a space should be because this is what they like learn. So sometimes it's interesting when you actually can do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like you can do whatever. And, you know, it's kind of like communicating that to not only your peers, but just people around you. And sometimes just by creating that, just by creating that space and disrupting it in that way is like, I guess the best way for me, I feel like. Well, for me, um, it was interesting because uh, as I mostly um, work with private collectors, not public collectors, um, during the pandemic, I was like stuck, of course, and I had the idea to create a club of collectors uh, because I was always hearing about, well, I would like to, to buy a piece to help because I was really, really worried about how could artists survive in that pandemic. So I was like, you know, you remember that I create many, many um, online events, uh, WhatsApp groups, and to, to sell art, to help the artists that I've been working with. And 
Uh, and then I, I, I was very, but well, I, I'd like to help, I'd help, I'd like to, to buy art pieces, but I don't know anything about art. And then I, I created a, a club, a collector's club, um, to inform, to put the collector in contact with the artist. And during these events, online events, during the weekends, I think, um, the collector could be there and connecting with the artist. And then they, they could call me and we inform about that artist or their um, technique. And, and that's, I think it, it was incredible because it changed my mind uh, for the digital, for, for the digital work, for the, the, this kind of work that was, uh, for me, it was hard in the beginning uh, because I was mostly in contact with my clients, with my, my artists. But I think that was the way I found during the pandemic to educate a little bit more and to inform uh, people um, how the art can um, be inside your house or inside your life and what it means not just to buy, what it really means, not just that, that business, but who is the artist, uh, where, where is, is it from, um, is it self that or academic. And it was really, really interesting for me because it was something that I could realize that even my clients that bought art from, from the artists didn't, you know, sometimes they don't know about the art, just why. And that's what I, I'm trying to, to do. To uh, well, I'm very happy that Simone uh, says that because I really think that the art world is a, is a tripod. You know, it's about the artist with his art, with art, the curator or gallerist, and also the the collector or the the the, the people who, people who enjoy it. So this tripod works has to work. Uh, each one has to, to make their own work, you know? I, 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 for example, in my, in my case, I leave all the part of the, I don't know, the, the connection between me and the collectors, for example, uh, with my manager or my, uh, the creator, because I only want to paint, you know? I only want to stay in my, in my studio painting, working, and that part, I, I don't know, I, Maybe I had have the time, but I, I don't. Maybe I don't want it to do it. You know, I prefer to leave that to someone else because I think that artists we are not we we are not we are not alone. We we have to work with with the with the curators and the galleries because they are the connection with the with the, the audience. You know, and other thing that I, that I really believe that, for example, right now at the, the I, th I really believe that at the end of the pandemic, but uh, um, in this particular a historical um, a case like like these or wars or, or when when the whole world is is worried about something for example dying you know uh, most of the the um, the feelings about uh, or, or emotions about life and uh, and live the present and being here being in touch with the moment are they are like showing again you, you know for example without the the black Peace. We, we, we wouldn't have the, the Renaissance, for example. So I really believe right now we are living an historical moment because right now everyone is had their emotions like like super uh, high, you know. So we have to 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 take this moment. I, I think that's a couple of years. I think, and then we are going to go back again to be the the materialist materialistic world. I I, I hope not, but. Um, I really believe that we have to work together as a tripod because that's the, for me, that's the better way to, to, to improve better in the, in the art world, I think. I understand what Chris says because we're, Francesca and I you know a lot of artists, well, we know a few artists who are very good at explaining their own work, but most of them are not very willing to do so because they want to focus on their work, which I understand. And my belief is that 
Not necessarily the artist is the best interpreter of his or her own work. There is always something more in the work that the artist can't see because he or she goes beyond the intentions. And as curators, I think our job is to uh, make room for that excess, for what is, exceeds the intentions. And this should reflect into uh, the display, uh, which is not always the case. It's difficult because then physical spaces uh, bring friction physical friction and you have to adapt to them uh, but this should always be the uh, the goal so uh, 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 yeah, ed ed educating the audience is probably not the way i would call it but um offering paths of experience um and interaction with the work is what we should be doing i believe uh, and Ideally, there should be a plurality of paths because uh, you know visitors can have different approaches, and each and every of them could actually can actually find a way to connect with the work uh, in a way we can't always predict. So we should make room for this. Then we also end up thinking about which is the best Instagram shot in the exhibition, of course. Uh, but but the you know the the goal should be this. I have to say that I really do not like the idea of uh, art uh, as uh, an educational tool. Um, I think art is. Um, free expression of human beings um, and uh, it can work an educational tool uh, just when it is real, sincere, uh, genuine as we said, um, but in a kind of uh, undirect way. Um, when artists uh, did their job properly, because they are good artists, they are connected with the reality and what they are doing, um, this is the uh, right way for me um, to, to have art connected to, to the community and, and reality. So without really forcing art uh, uh, to to have uh, an educational role uh, in, in the community. Art is just art and uh, um, and um, how can I say? <laughs> um, I think it's uh, important uh, um, as uh, um, um, the, the other participant here at the said that uh, um, it has to be very connected with uh, with the context, with the community, and in this way it educates without uh, uh, saying it uh, exactly. It's it's very interesting what you were mentioning because you do you do have like a lot of art education program, but at the end of it, if if everything flows correctly, it should be almost not even being tagged like this in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back on something that Luca was saying, you, you were asking. So we're going to move to the digital spaces now. Um, and you were, you were talking for the physical one that you have frictions. So maybe in the digital space we don't have frictions anymore <laughs> um but i'll i'll, I'll let uh, tan and jenny like talk about their experience um but now like that's that's really what we are doing at our pool our goal is absolutely not to erase physical space it's extremely important to us that you know art continues to be um living here and, and 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 everywhere but we also feel like there is this massive opportunity to you know, liaise with new audience, audiences. Um, it's, I mean, we talked a lot about it, but I think the public is, is one of the most important thing um, and, and bringing, bringing the arts uh, to the most amount of people. Um, it's personally what, what I'm, like one of the 
the good thing I'm seeing, but I would love to have uh, your opinion on, you know, how it is to, to work um, in the digital space, you know, your experience, like on the project we had on, in the metaverse as well, and, and, you know, what you want to share with us. And then I'll, I'll ask you, like, if you feel like there is opportunities for you, if, um, you know, if, if you feel like you, you wouldn't want to go in or, you know, like anything that comes to your mind, like, um, because there is many ways, like the metaverse and what we're going to be showing you. So is one thing, um, but you probably have seen, we have also on the platform, like a exhibition tool that is like a 2D map. So very web too, but that still does the job, like it do the job, you know, because you can put the artworks, you can put the content, um, but how, like, how would you see it if, if you are interested or if you are not, like, why? That's, that's my question. So much to say. So, um, first of all, the first thing I want to, like, acknowledge is that when people hear about the metaverse, the first thing that, first reaction that people have is fear. Like, it's like this unknown, that sounds very apocalyptic of all of us becoming cyborgs. And the truth is that our phones are also already the metaverse. And there's levels to, to digital life. I think the metaverse is a very broad term that has come to has come to surface in the past year, but really it encompasses everything that has to do with digital life. Um, there's a, a really interesting study. Uh, from journalism in the past year, everything that used to be referred as uh, digital, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, even the word virtual, uh, all of those words have been replaced in the media by metaverse. So it's just means digital. Um, and Facebook doesn't just own that word just because they claimed it. So there's a lot of, you know, good reasons to be fearful, but there's also a lot of other reasons to be hopeful. Um, so, and we can talk about that forever. I can talk about that forever. But in the reasons to be hopeful, um, specifically when it comes to curating spaces and the possibilities of digital life, I think we've only scratched the surface of this. Um, I'll give you a very practical example right now when we are working on this metaverse project with Gianni's amazing work. I mean, um, usually the people who build the metaverse, they're, they're called world builders and they're, called, and they're, this, they're designers that have engineering skills. Um, and they, the concept can come from an artist um, or the artist can learn new mediums and new tools to have those skills, but it's the first thing I'm going to say is that it's the work of a collective. And digital life works in communities and collectives. So the first thing you encounter when you come into a digital space is that you're not alone. You're not alone in your studio as an artist, and you're not alone with your pen and paper as a curator. You have to work and interact with other people with different disciplines, which I personally find extremely interesting. And um, when there's this digital space, our brains cannot grasp the infinite possibilities of digital space, like, for example, the fact that there's no gravity, or the fact that we don't need walls in order to put art on them. Um, so usually, the designs that you see in this metaverse right now have to have some sort of familiar aspect of um, gravity and walls so that we can even understand what we're looking at. And we, so we are at this very early stage and early level of even conceptualizing these spaces. Um, so for example, we, we put one of Jani's amazing work on a, on a wall in this space that the designers immediately put on the wall. And the scale of it, you know, was not the exact scale of the wall as you would, you, what you do when you do street art that you just use the wall and work with the scale of the wall. So I was just, let's just cut the wall. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's, yeah I know, but it's, it's like you can cut the wall, you know, you can cut the wall and you can fly. And, you know, Nike just came out with, uh, bought a company called Artifact. Um, that creates avatars and, and digital assets and, you know, you can have Nike shoes that can fly 
and that have fire that are lit up on fire. I mean, the possibilities are endless. So these are like just very tangible examples of how the possibilities are endless, but our brains are not ready for it. Similar to when you know we went from horse carriages to cars, and the first cars had like horses drawn on them because people couldn't understand how this thing was going to move on its own. Um, it's it's kind of that stage where we're at right now, and there's so much I can say about the metaverse, but I feel like this is a tangible example that people can digest. Um. I guess for me, and well, first and foremost, let me just say that like I'm a video game nerd. Like I play video games all the time. Like even in my practice, I find ways for video games to um, inspire directly my work because of you know once again, like we said, like it it took it takes teams to create video games, and the video games are getting they're becoming digital movies that you're just you're literally just playing a movie with a controller. But if you think about the time it takes to build an entire city, you know you have a team of people, you have a team of architects. Like it, it's just it, it's massive, but. Even in video games, certain things have to be, there are certain rules that are put in place and certain things have to be set in a certain reality, like you said, in order for us to like understand it. So even in the metaverse, like that was something that I had to learn because like my first thought is like, oh, I'm going to build something in the metaverse. I need to build a gallery in the metaverse, but what is a gallery in the metaverse in a place where time things doesn't exist, gravity doesn't exist, it like it just, you know, and, and like you said, like it takes, it, it takes time, and the reason why I said that I'm, a, I'm, I'm really a video game nerd is because it allowed me, I guess, the, uh, I wouldn't say brain power, but it, it just allowed me to, it allowed me to allow things to happen and for me to adapt to that because that's what you learn in video games, like you might lose your power or you might get a new weapon or you might be building a space in a video game and then certain things happen and now you have to adapt to that and you're able to because you know like that's how it goes okay this this code must have been written for this to happen at this moment but what happens when the code wasn't written for that you, know, you have to be the one to write the code it's no different from having a, a blank canvas or sometimes the best um hmm, so you, i'm sorry i'm like my mind is moving as i'm talking so we said blank canvas right so to me, I think it's better to put a blank canvas in someone's hand with some tools to do something than to just tell them what to do. If you tell someone what to do, the work is going to be based off of what you told them. But if you just tell them, hey, just have at it, that's when it gets interesting because then it's like, oh, okay, what are we creating? From? Okay, like this person is just taking their time to just create something from scratch. Um, so then when you add this digital element to it, once again, like, me being a video game nerd also made me an early adopter. So I'm an early adopter. Like the the first iPhone, I was in it. Like you know what I mean. And and the reason why we can even use the iPhone as a case study is the fact that when it first came out, and I tried to convince my friends to get it, they were like, "Why would I type?" And this is so funny because my manager is the same way. He has yet to really like advanced to using a smartphone he still needs a physical keyboard and I asked him why and he says it's just my hands are too big I'm like my hands are bigger than yours <laughs> I use a, you know I know seven foot tall basketball players that are on their iPhones but we just it, it's at one point where you just either you're going to early adopt it or you're going to get left behind and that's kind of like where we're at with it and it's, you know, it's kind of scary to say like okay you're just going to get left behind but you think about it with the iPhone, it was so, I was against the iPhone when it first came out. I'm like, how am I going to communicate and not have a keyboard? And then I just, you know, I would watch the, the talks, I would watch uh, Steve Jobs, just, and I'm, I'm like, why do I want to be on the outside looking in? Why do I want to miss this? I don't want to miss the next thing, you know, and it's just like, I guess I have a fear of missing out, but also, it's so many opportunities to we rewrite history, and that's what I think the metaverse is. It's like we're actually seeing it happen. And do you want to be the person that didn't invest in the iPhone again? So it's like, yeah, we could talk all day about what the possibilities are, but you have to think about it. Um, do you want to be left behind? Do you, and, and you actually don't have to. And one thing that's interesting about the metaverse or just this, this digital world that we're in now and that we're trying to build is like it's accessible 
to anyone, anybody, any shape, size, color, sexual preference, anyone has the ability to create, to, to even if you're not an artist, there's still space for you to even just exist or create in the world. For example, one of my good friends, she's a, um, a singer songwriter, um, and she's really big, she's like super famous, and I was like taking the time to kind of like explain NFTs to her, and you know, it was hard for her to understand. She's a busy woman as well, so it's just like, it was hard for her to wrap her head around it, but I was like telling her, like onboarding her, telling her to download a meta mask, and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, we got to an interesting point where she kind of like just gave up and she probably just got busy or, or something like that. But I was trying to explain to her, like, even when you're not a creator, you're not an artist in the sense of like you create something with your hand. It doesn't mean that you can't be a part of the space. You're a singer. You could sell. You know what I mean? It's not even about something. You can display your music videos, your music, or it would just be cool the fact that you can just be a collector in that space. There are people that have gotten famous from owning, like, you know, a digital ape, or, and it's just for the fact that they own it. It gave them a platform to then communicate whatever it is that they wanted because they're in on it. You know what I'm saying? So when I think of this, it's so many different ways of accessing and being a part of the story. You just don't have to be a creator. You just don't have to be an architect. You just don't, you could just be a person that just enjoys conversation and meeting new people and once again these spaces force you to you know create I mean, they force you not they don't force you to create they force you to communicate which i think is like the most important part and this is how you like can change the world i, I believe and i really think that we're in that pressure right now where like we don't know what's next but it doesn't matter if we don't know it's like don't you want to be a part of that discussion yeah and uh, for sure, I don't want to be out of this. <laughs> um, but the, my first, ex like I say, experience with the digital um, world, I was talking with uh, Audi in the first meeting, virtual meeting. And it was like really, really funny because I was doing the, um, the art best of the art, the last. Art Basel in Miami, and there was an artist, a famous artist, who called me and said, well, I'm going to launch my first NFT during the Red Dead in your, in your booth. And I was like, what? What is an NFT? I was really, I know that exists, but I didn't know, I, I didn't know anything about it. And I was like, but how can you do that? Do you need a wall, but a computer or something? And I was like, just lost. And he said, no, don't worry. I just need a wall because I'm going to bring a print of this NFT. And during the event tonight, I'm going to launch this on a live. Blah, blah, blah. And I was really like, OK, we have a wall. And you are welcome. <laughs> and that's all. And in that moment, I, I realized that I couldn't um, keep going out of this world because the artists come to me and asking me about, are you going to do the next exhibition with considering something about NFT? And I was like, oh, yes, sure. And when I met Audi, uh, with the, the platform, I was like, I really need to, to learn about it because um, it's something that I'm, as, I, I am an architect. So first of all, it was sketches with pencil and pens. And, and then when I read the, the AutoCAD, I was like, oh my God, how can I do it? How can I manage this? It was really hard. But then how can I live without AutoCAD? Then goes to the 3D and the, you know, the beam, and how can we live without it? And I think I'm going to, to of course, uh, be introducing this word with the article because uh, I think uh, for me it's important also to, to have a creatorship platform and that's why I'm, I'm here because it, uh, I want to go in this, this world but not just like to 
uh, big platforms that it's selling and selling and, and it's it's like um, she said like you have a community and that's why I think it's better to have a curatorship in this platform and for sure I'm going to to be in and keep learning about it and I think it's it's a way that you know it's it's already here so. And I have a, a, a kid, and <laughs> for sure, <laughs> he, he knows what is a painting because he's always with me in galleries and exhibitions. But he he knows more how to to do the things in the the phone, the smartphones, than I. So I need to, and it's another, it's this, the next generations, and we can we can just leave this passing by us and be out of this world. Well, um, I think we really live in different worlds. You know, when we go to bed and, and sleep, we start dreaming. And there, we start building uh, cities and building everything, you know? So, and you know, that, that tiny moment when you, you don't know if you're awake or you're sleeping, I think, if we can do the actually the digital world on the real world, because what is real right now, um, the line is getting blurry every time or every time. time. For example, we, we came like uh, like a week ago, and I, I I don't have internet in my phone, so I I I I, I was feeling like I was living a different life, you know, because I couldn't do anything without my phone, uh, nothing, even communicate with, with anyone. So I was. I really, I really uh, uh, feel that uh, that the digital world is already with us. So the the question here is, where do you wanna make your art? So it's not about if you one is better or the other one. It's just where do you wanna make your art? So because we're already there, you know, and the real world and the digital world works at the same, the same, the same, the same way. It's just electrical connections. One in our brain and the other one is in the computer. But for me, it can be the same thing. But so the question is, where do you want to work with? Uh, as, a, as a painter, as a physical painter, um, for the moment, uh, I want to stay in the, in the world that we know. Uh, but, but I don't, I can see myself uh, in a, maybe in a, in a couple of years or maybe tomorrow, I don't know, uh, giving a step into the, in the digital world. You know, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, thought about that uh, until I think right now. <laughs> but, um, but yes, the, it's part of the world. We don't live just in one world. We live in um, too many, a lot of worlds. So it's, I think it's important to, to give um, the importance of that as well. Yeah, I agree that there are a lot of interesting possibilities with this new digital technologies, there's a lot of freedom. There, there is also uh, room to rethink preconceptions. As you said, uh, it can be a, a space that's timeless, a gravity-less uh, environment, um, which also means it can be frictionless. And this might turn into a problem at some point. Uh, because um, without friction, uh, it's more difficult to uh, find relevance. And as I said, you were talking about uh, CAD design, right? At some point, architects uh, acquired knowledge of CAD design and they could actually design shapes that were unconceivable before, right? Because they, nobody could actually draw them. Now, the challenge for uh, artists in the digital world is how to um, how to find a specific language with, within those technologies, because it can't just be a translation of physical art into the digital. As, as you said, I mean, it can't just be mirroring, because it doesn't, just doesn't work. So, uh, when I, when I hear about an artist who has made an NFT out of a, a, a print or a photograph, uh, I, I wonder, but does it really 
add anything to his work, or is just a different, you know, selling channel, which is good. I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with that. But um, I'm still very curious to see uh, what new edge technology can bring to the artist practice. Uh, Mark Rothko, you know, struggled for 20 years before finding his way of painting. Uh, so maybe our digital artists should struggle a little bit to find their own language within technology. And this is still to be found, at least from my perspective, but I know very little. And this is the reason why we're here to learn. And I have to be as one that I know very little about the metaverse. Um, I think the pandemic accelerates a lot the connection with the digital world for everybody, not normal user of the digital world. And um, what happened, in my opinion, especially in the art world, was that uh, many artists and galleries uh, just uh, try to transfer and mirror, as we said, the real world into the digital. And for me, it was uh, very disappointing and frustrating uh, because uh, um, the experience I had in the digital world visiting exhibition that just moved them from the real world to the digital was not satisfying for me. Um, so uh, I agree that uh, um, the art world uh, globally has to uh, find really a new language to to to, uh, to live in in the new world uh, which the metaverse is. So it's not enough for just to transform. Uh, real uh, physical uh, painting or artwork into a uh, um, digital format uh, because uh, this transformation in my opinion uh, doesn't add anything to the work of the of the, um, of the artist but we need just to find new languages uh, to to express ourselves uh, in in a new world yeah, the, yeah, I believe the medium should should make sense on, on its own, say, yeah. And, and just one remark, I believe the 2D map of the digital exhibitions is very, very clever. Because it, it's not it's not a translation, it's, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it helps, it adds something to the experience of the digital uh, exhibition. I just want to add something. Um, uh, like AutoCAD, uh, it works like a tool to accelerate your your, your work. And I think with, in Metaverse, it's different because it's another um, environment and so. Uh, I know uh, artists that in Metaverse have, has created um, a character. So it's not that artist, it's another artist because it's another uh, environment. So. Um, I think for me, when I realized that uh, the digital uh, world was not only a tool to sell, to, to, no, to sell for sale, um, I could act more about, yeah, I can be there because there's more uh, sense for me. You know? I think that was like the deciding factor for me too. Once I, I saw that you don't just have to sell to be, you know, a player in the game, we're going to keep using game references now. But I think that, that that was a selling point for me because, once again, it's just, first of all, it's the Wild Wild West. And what we're talking about now, maybe it won't be the same thing in a year or in a month. Like, I don't know. Just like the iPhone, just like so many different uh, technologies, or, or even AutoCAD. Like, where AutoCAD started and what you can do in it versus what you can do now at the present moment. What happened, it was just evolution. It was time. Developers come in and say, we're going to change this. We're going to change this aspect. We're going to make the functionality easier. It's the same thing even with digital art. The reason why in digital art, and it's crazy because I just got into digital art within the past two years and the pandemic kind of like uh, forced my hand a little because I was just trying to figure out how to express myself since I can't bring people 
in inside and we couldn't go outside. So it's like, it just forced me to, to digitize. But even in that technology alone, in the idea of digital illustration, you might, you guys might notice the influx of digital illustration even at this moment right now. And that's because of the iPad and the fact that they figured out a way of bringing the tools that were available, I guess, in Photoshop, Illustrator, et cetera, et cetera, and making them um, streamline, streamline, streamlining it all into a simpler form, which is Procreate. And in in that alone, I think is the same thing with the metaverse. It's like whatever this version we're on right now, like whatever this conversation is, or whatever. Um, these worlds that we could potentially create we're just in the beginning stages of it so we could ask like a million questions of like you know how could it affect you know how could it affect um the viewership or how you view the artist could the artist make money does this change things for the curators is you know does this mean people are not going to come to galleries anymore and i like what you said too because you said uh you were talking about how you know it's it's another world you know, in, 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 in essence it is, but it's a world that's just endless and we can do whatever, but it's the thing is, it's like, what can we do? And you made an interesting point just about communities and how it just kind of like, I always use this uh, expression, it takes a village. So even in the metaverse, it's the same thing, like it just takes a village. Like there are going to be things that I don't know, but there are people that do know. And then if I know one thing and you know another thing and this person over there knows that, let's just like bring it all together and like invent what the next thing is. And the fact that it's so radical is what is making people, um, I wouldn't say people are scared, but people are just skeptical. Like I'm, I'm still skeptical of it and I, and I try and I decided to just go face first into it, but I'm still skeptical because I started off in the physical space and I, you know, took so much time and effort to kind of like, make people understand my artwork in a physical space. It's like now you're throwing a computer in the phone in front of me and you're telling me, okay, now make, make it make sense there. But I think that's the what makes it fun. And I think I like the challenge of it all. And once again, I just thought like, I don't want to be, and it's not, and I don't have a fear of missing out, but I don't want to be left behind because we're forever evolving. Humanity, you know, everything's forever evolving. So it's like, why, like, why not? I mean, it's just how I look at everything, you know? So, of course, like, I don't have all the answers. I can't figure everything out, like, you know what I mean? But I'm going to, I'm just willing to take the risk because it's a new space. And I just, I love the idea of new spaces. Yeah, I think no matter which medium and which cycle of evolve or evolution we're at in art or in life, um, I think the artists are artists are gonna find the uh, the ways and the tools to tell human stories, and they're gonna use whatever tools and technology are available at the time to tell the stories of the time. So, for example, there's two really good examples in this Biennale for everyone who wants to like see things in a tangible way that I think pro are talking about new languages, but that are still very easily understood from an artistic point of view and also pushing the boundaries of what these tools can create uh, for audiences. So one example is um, there's the Romanian Pavilion, which is divided in two, and the second part is outside of the Giordini. And the artist created a VR experience in which they're telling intimate intimate stories between couples, but you can use the VR headset to touch the person who you're seeing in three dimensions in front of you, and you can teleport and become that person, and then you are that person having an intimate relationship with someone else, which you're literally putting yourselves in the shoes and in the body of the other person. And there is no other artistic medium that I've experienced that can give you the experience of feeling like the other person is feeling and having another interaction. This kind of thing reminds me of like a theatrical technique where like actors change their shoes that they're wearing into the shoes of their character to like feel themselves and feel what it feels to be an art person. And yesterday when I was having that VR experience and I'm into VR, I have the Oculus, I enjoy exploring like 
how curation in this medium means, this was like a, a transcendent new language. Um, and another good experience is that Ocean Space, um, which is curated by Jules Martinez, and they do augmented reality. But the whole exhibition is about the ocean and nature, but it's a really, really beautiful juxtaposition of like organic materials and technological materials. So they give you an iPad that you go around the show and you see this beautiful old church um, with these organic artworks with screens embedded on them and then you have augmented reality on top of that. And it almost feels like there are spirits there that some people can see but you can now see that there is like another layer to it and you're interacting with the space and seeing what it means. Um, also during this Biennale, um, I went to a project by Hans Ulrich Obrist. It was a stock project called Unfinished and there was an artist from Colombia, Lina Miquete, I think is her last name, and she spent a lot of time in the Amazon forest and speaking to indigenous tribes and researching this idea of like different kinds of realities. Because what we think is physical, like Chris, you were talking about that, like what we think is like physical, tangible reality is not multicultural. There are other cultures that think about reality in completely different terms. So they analyzed these new technologies and deconstructed them to their core material, which is literally minerals and electricity. And they just decided that uh, she worked with them on creating like a mental map of the metaverse, comparing it to like alternative realities in Amazonian cult cultures. And there are parallels. And they, they accepted these technologies because they believe that you know, if our reality can be accepted, then this reality can be accepted as well. And those are, for me, the keys to have not only the art world, but also audiences understanding this world in a much deeper way beyond, like, marketplaces and blockchain technology, which I, I believe fully necessary and useful, but from a language, non-market, institutional, artistic perspective, there, those, language, those languages are coming. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we, we're going to end up here, except if any of you have anything else to say. Chris, you want to say more? Well, I really look up because as a, as a physical artist, for example, as the first time that I, that I heard about NFT, um, someone says to me, oh, you can sell, and you can sell, and you can sell, and, and you can make a lot of money. And I was like, well, of course I want to make money, and of course I want to sell my paintings, but uh, that's not my goal. I want to share my experience. I want to give something to the, to the world and to the audience. And, and if they, that was the first time that I, that I heard about that, and I thought that about that, but I, I was like, that's not my goal. I, don't, I, I just want to just make money. I want to make uh, something that has a meaning. So I really look at it because I, I really think that uh, digital art world is finding their own way. And I really think they're gonna mix it up with the physical art, and it has a it has a, um, a role that both can be the just one, you know, um, because right now for me, just selling a, a print or selling a, a, a an image of my, my painting for me has has no soul, you know. So if you find it, as Lucas says, if it finds their way. Uh, to connect each other in in the in the in the short uh, future, you know, it would be amazing because we're already living in a, in, a, in a digital world. We are we are already there. We, we can live right now without without the digital part of our lives. Uh, so, so yes, and thank you. Actually, I'm, I'm in a lot of Twitter spaces because the NFT space you have to be and have this a lot this question. What would you say to an artist who wants to enter the NFT space? And my main uh, reply would be stay honest to your practice, you know, so don't, don't do it to sell because eventually you're going to sell, but then it's going to fall. So stay honest, continue to do your work, find the right people to work with you, to go to your idea and how you would see your work in, in the digital world and, and make it happen. But 
but keep the same, you know, thing that you want to carry and put out. Um, yes, so just to finish, maybe you probably have seen what's going on up there. Um, so this is the work of Jani Lee, curated by Tan Green. Um, this, you can find it in the central end. We had the really great chance to work with Boson Protocol. It's a work in progress, yeah, because we're going to have uh, an event next month within Boson Protocol space. It's named Boson Portal. Um, and we'll, we'll do some great stuff with Jenny and Tam in there. Um, so follow, follow, follow my work and, and you can join in there and you can listen to some music and you can like and talk together. Um, just to give you a bit more about our partner, Boson. So they are a totally Web3 company. Uh, and what they are doing is um, they are creating that bridge between the physical and the digital. So um, you are basically buying an NFT that is linked to something physical. With Jenny, you will discover it, but we'll have also physical works. Um, and you can resell your NFT until you redeem it and you get the physical object. So there is bridges being done. There is a lot of companies building to create those bridges. With us is to finance the art in, in, in the real world as well. Like Boson, it's to do that commercial link in a way. Um, so yeah. Follow the space, learn from it, uh, discuss, dialogue, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, all of you, um, for sharing your experience with us and uh, for all of you who came and the one online as well. Um, have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you.